Good afternoon. I'm Janine, Dr. Janine Beyer, a board-certified pathologist practicing at Kaiser Permanente. I'm incredibly pleased today to be joined by my incredible colleagues in recognition of Lung Cancer Awareness Month this November. We're excited to talk to you today about advancements in screening and treatment of lung cancer. With Kaiser Permanente's collaborative care model and the use of cutting edge technologies, we're able to work with patients to detect lung cancer earlier and develop personalized treatment plans. Let's get started by having my fellow physician panelists introduce themselves. Dr. Chi, would you go first, please? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Dr. Anthony Chi. I'm a board certified pathologist practicing at Kaiser Permanente in Rockville, Maryland, with specialty training in head and neck pathology and hematopathology, as well as interest in molecular pathology. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Jeet Lund. I'm a board certified uh, pulmonologist working in Largo, Maryland with Kaiser Permanente. Um, I also have special training in interventional pulmonology. Hi, I'm Dr. Ron Wolfenpour, and I'm a thoracic surgeon, and I, I practice out of Silver Spring and cover the region, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Hi, I am Dr. Shanique Palmer, a board-certified medical oncologist practicing with Kaiser Permanente in Baltimore, Maryland. And hi, I'm Dr. Shashi Ranganath, a board-certified diagnostic radiologist practicing at Kaiser Permanente in Northern Virginia. As you can see, we have providers from every different service line here today to talk to you, and each of them holds a unique purpose in the care of lung cancer treatment and in the efforts to reduce risk of lung cancer. Dr. Lund, Lund, can we start with you, please, to tell us what are the risks of lung cancer and how can I reduce my risks? Uh, thank you, Dr. Byer. Um, so number one risk uh, is smoking. You know, smoking attributes to 90% of all um, uh, the cause of lung cancer. So uh, smoking cessation or stopping smoking is the number one thing we can do to reduce our risk. And um, the other things that can cause lung cancer are mostly occupational and environmental, but I do want to emphasize that smoking uh, by far is the most important risk factor. And is there any duration of smoking uh, that may increase a risk factor? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think uh, for the screening, criteria for lung cancer, you know, uh, smoking above 20 years puts you at risk uh, and would, you know, if you're above the age of 50 would uh, put you in the category to get a screen for lung cancer, uh, but certainly anything above 15, 20 years puts you at risk. And at the same token, um, stopping smoking, even cutting down by half the amount you smoke can reduce that risk over uh, several years. Thank you so much. And we talk about screening, uh, we are talking about using, using radiology techniques to image patients' lungs to see what are the lungs, are they healthy or are there lesions there that need to be explored? And Dr. Shashi Raghunath is uh, one of our radiologists on the panel today. Um, how do doctors screen specifically for and diagnose lung cancer? Yeah, thanks Dr. Bayer. Um, so, so the mainstay of diagnosing lung cancer is something called a low dose chest CT. So it's a special kind of x-ray where we take multiple pictures of a person's lungs. We stack those images together and then those images are analyzed by a radiologist. So it's important to know that there's no special preparation for this. You can not, you don't have to eat anything special or, or not be uh, without anything to eat or drink. Um, and you don't need IV dye or IV contrast. So there's really nothing that you have to do to prepare for it. The actual examination only takes a few seconds. It's completely non-invasive, it's painless. Um, and you can take your medications before and after and go about your regular work and your other activities as usual. Um, so sometimes patients ask, can I get a, a chest x-ray instead of a chest CT? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, the resolution from a chest x-ray is simply not high enough to detect the pulmonary nodules, which is the main thing that we're looking for when we're screening for lung cancer. So after you get your examination, those images are sent um, for a radiologist to review. So we have board-certified radiologists with special training in lung cancer screening. 
And so after they um, review the study, they um, issue an assessment category and a specific recommendation. So the vast majority of lung cancer screening CTs turn out to be normal, or we see something that's benign and nothing to worry about. And so if we see that, then we'll issue an assessment saying you should come back in, in one year to repeat the screening to make sure that nothing is developing. If we see something that's, that's not suspicious for lung cancer, but not quite normal, we may say, hey, we need you to come back in three or six months just to take another look at this to make sure that there's nothing to worry about. And, and almost always it's nothing to worry about. It's just something that we've found and that's incidental. And the probability of developing lung cancer in the next 12 months is very, very low. If we see a suspicious lung nodule um, or mass is detected, then the radiologist reading the scan will immediately recommend that we consult with a pulmonologist, a, a lung specialist. So um, every suspicious lung abnormality um, that's found on a lung cancer screening CT is, is reviewed and then also discussed later. And Dr. Raghunath, can you tell our patients, are there multiple sites where they can have this uh, CT scan for screening? Yes, that's a great question. So any, any of our sites that has a CT scanner, we can do, we can do it at that site. So there's no special restrictions. Um, all of our scanners are state of the art and equipped with a specific protocol for lung cancer screening. It sounds very easy and straightforward. Um, and I've, I've also heard that we're over screening for our population for lung cancer that Kaiser Permanente Mid-Atlantic does a fantastic job uh, looking at patients who have any smoking history. Um, does anyone want to add to that, or should we go to what it might look like if there is a suspicious lesion found? Um, Dr. Bai, I'll, I'll just add that when I said if there's an abnormality found that's suspicious, it's, it's reviewed by a multidisciplinary team. So every week we have a special lung cancer screening conference, and that's um, covered by experts. So it's diagnostic radiologists, interventional radiologists, pulmonologists, thoracic surgeons, and radiation oncologists. And so we review the suspicious scans um, so that we can come up with, with a plan. That's really incredible. And it shows the power of integrative medicine to have a bunch of physicians with different specialties uh, planning for our patients what the next best steps are. Um, also, our radiologists, there are some radiologists who do a technique for biopsy. Um, and that would be in a nodule that is suspicious and we need to see what the tissue is growing. So that's our role as pathologists. And if we can put up the slide, um, the first slide that we have for pathology. Just wanted to show our patients uh, what we, how we diagnose and what we collect from you. You can see it's very, very small amount of tissue. In fact, the image on the left hand of your screen shows just a touch imprint. Um, so almost like as if you had paint on your finger and you touched it to that slide. And we're helping our interventional radiologist to know that we're in the lesion. Once we know that they're in the lesion with radiographic help and help of our on-site pathologist, we're able to submit that tissue and look at it more closely. And you can see the top image on the right-hand side is comprised of cells that don't look regular. They're irregular, large, and abnormal. And this is where we make a diagnosis of lung cancer. Dr. Chi, do you quickly want to talk about um, the really incredible special offering that we have in-house here in regards to molecular pathology and looking at the genotype of lung cancers? Sure. So once we make the diagnosis of lung cancer, such as lung adenocarcinoma, um, and the, um, the clock start kicking. Um, so if we can advance to the next slide. So starting 2023, um, Kaiser Permanente and Mid-Atlantic has internalized the molecular testing capability. As soon as we make the diagnosis of lung cancer, we are able to put the, um, the lung cancer tissue sample that you see um, on the previous slide um, through our molecular testing platform. Um, usually, 
the time it takes um, right from the um the beginning of the testing to the end of the test where we will issue the um the molecular report um is less than three days. Um this is in vast contrast um, um for other um institute who rely on external vendor um, where the turnaround time, um, the wait time um, to get molecular results may be up to two weeks or sometimes even longer. So as you can see for this particular sample, um, when we analyzed um, the tumor sample by sequencing its DNA and RNA, we immediately identify um, a biomarker, which is um, met at some 14 skipping. Um, and there is an FDA approved therapeutic um, um, Associating association um, with this drug and um, with um, this cancer. And this is immediately forwarded to the treating oncologist. That's some of the back end diagnostic work that we do as pathologists. Although you won't see us in the office, we are behind the scenes rendering diagnoses. I wondered if our thoracic surgeon might jump in and talk a little bit about uh, surgical care of lung cancers, which lung cancers might undergo surgical care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so uh, in general, the, the mainstay treatment for early stage lung cancer, and we're talking about lung cancer that's still limited to the, to the lungs and hasn't spread outside the lung, or essentially stage one or and some stage two cancer uh, is surgery. and um, and that's removing part of the lung that has the cancer, as well as all the lymph nodes that are uh, surrounding or draining that part of the lung. And the amount of the lung that has to be removed or that, that should be removed can vary. Uh, it could be as a result of the size of the tumor or the location, um, whether lymph nodes are involved, and also the patient characteristics. So we can think about how, how many comorbidities or medical problems patients have in all uh, their lung capacity and, and things like their physical capacity. These are factors that determine how much of the lung we remove. I mean, in general, that there are three main types of lung removal, or I should probably say four. The first one, you know, we call pneumonectomy, and that's removing the entire lung on one side. And, and as a matter of fact, we don't use that as a, as a means of treating the early stage lung cancer. And so the main, the standard treatment or standard removal of lung for early stage lung cancer is what we call lobectomy. And that's removing about a third or to a half of the lung on each side. And then there is another form called segmentectomy, which is less than you know, a lobectomy. And then a wedge resection is the smallest amount of the part of the lung that you would remove. And that's really just taking out a wedge or what you could think about as a, a slice of a pie or pizza. And, and essentially the goal is to, to remove that, that cancer and as well as the lymph nodes. Uh, we have different approaches to accomplishing these surgeries. The most common or the standard, the classic traditional method uh, is, is through a, a something called a thoracotomy, where we make a six to eight, eight inches long incision under the armpit on the side of the chest and spread the ribs in order to visualize the, the, the chest and remove the lung. Now, the newer method, or I should say more common method these days is what we call a minimally invasive um, robotic or video assisted thoracic surgery. And, and that essentially uses smaller incisions. And we're talking about half inch incisions, using a couple of half inch incisions on the side of the chest and, and getting inside the chest and accomplishing the same goal um, and invariably lead into less pain, um, shorter hospital stay and, and quicker recovery. And I would say that 90% or more of our, our, our surgeries are minimally invasively done in our department. And, um, and patients find it more satisfying in terms of the outcome. Now, in terms of the length of the surgery, uh, overall it takes about two to four hours, including anesthesia time, depending on what kind of surgery we're doing. And patients stay in the hospital for one to three days and they essentially go home and recover over the next four to six weeks with the eight of our medical staff or ancillary staff, physical therapists. And uh, after that, they get surveilled or they undergo CT scan surveillance twice a year for about the next three years and then annually after that. And, and the bottom line about, you know, the question of whether they need any additional treatment like chemo or radiation therapy, 
It really depends on what uh, we find after removing the part of the lung. And that's based on whether or not the lymph nodes are involved or whether, you know, based on the size. And, and we'll have our colleagues talk more on that. It sounds like you're very thoughtful about the approach to a lung cancer. And um, certainly on the forefront of your mind is uh, patient recovery. Um, and if, as a patient myself, I would really appreciate that. Um, Dr. Palmer, you see patients after surgery as the treating oncologist. Um, and can you give us a little bit of a role of what you might do for um, providing care to a lung cancer patient? Yes, absolutely. So the, the management of lung cancer really may involve several different treatment modalities, which may include surgery, um, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, this targeted therapy, there's immunotherapy that may be offered to any individual patient. And uh, just to explain by targeted therapy, I mean drugs that are specifically aimed at identifying and attacking certain types of cancer cells with less harm to normal cells. And we would need the molecular profile of the cancer, which Dr. Chi uh, made reference to earlier, to see if a patient has a specific abnormality or a target for a particular drug. And immunotherapy involves uh, drugs that are able to harness or stimulate the body's immune system to help fight cancer. And so the approach to each patient is really individualized and uh, it's a truly a collaborative approach that uh, often involves the expertise of every one of my colleagues um, on this panel here. Um, there's no one approach that can be applied to all patients. And there are several pieces of information that will need to be reviewed in detail before being able to formulate this personalized plan for the patient. So as an oncologist, when I first see a patient with lung cancer, um, you know, the, the patient may already have had surgery or they may not have, but I will need to review that patient's scans and the official report from the radiologist. I need to know how big is this tumor? Where in the lung is it? Are there any lymph nodes that appear to be involved? Is there any spread anywhere? And this enables us to assign a stage to the patient's cancer. I need information from my colleagues in pathology. Um, what kind of lung cancer is it? And uh, you know what uh, molecular mutations are there? Um, I need to know the patient's functional status and overall health. Can this patient climb a flight of stairs? What's their heart function? What's their kidney function? Remembering that we have to ensure that a patient's body is able to tolerate any given therapy. And then taking all this information into, a, into account, we're then able to discuss the different treatment options and collaborate for the best multidisciplinary approach. And several doctors may help with different types of treatment at different points in the process. So for example, if I see a patient after he or she has had surgery for small stage one or stage two lung cancer, and that patient has is still overall healthy, uh, that patient may require chemotherapy and or radiation, um, sometimes followed by immunotherapy or targeted therapy, depending on the size and the characteristics of the tumor and lymph nodes that were removed and the molecular makeup of that tumor. If the patient is found upfront to have stage three lung cancer with lymph nodes involved, that patient may receive treatment with combined chemotherapy and radiation and followed by immunotherapy. And for someone who has stage four disease, meaning that we know that this patient has cancer spread up front, then this is particularly where the molecular makeup of the tumor becomes so important, where we are then able to try to discern which patients will do best with chemotherapy, which do best with targeted therapy, and which patients need immunotherapy. And so really in summary, patients are, the approach is really individualized and collaborative um, in every sense of the word. Thank you so much for all of that energy and effort uh, that goes into caring for our lung cancer patients. Do you at the forefront of your mind have a success story that you would want to share with the group? Um, we can certainly circle back as well to talk about success stories, because there is one um, topic that we didn't get to, and that's something new that we have with Dr. Lund. 
You, you know, I, I can I can speak on on success stories. Um, you know, I, I will say first of all that um, when I was finishing up my oncology training eleven years ago, we spoke about surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Targeted therapy and immunotherapy are new treatments that have really revolutionized the care of lung cancer. They're effective, they cause less toxicity than chemotherapy, and they generally result in better overall outcomes than chemotherapy alone. And so I really have several patients who have done remarkably well and remarkably better than they, than patients in a, a, with similar stage of cancer had done 10 years before. We have patients on targeted treatment who are, you know, living for several years, which is something that was not very common uh, back, uh, you know, 10 years ago. So without speaking about a particular patient, there are just several on these uh, new treatments that are, are doing a lot better. And for early stage patients as well, there are also several success stories with increased uh, screening and, uh, you know, catching cancers early. We have many patients who are several years out from their cancer surgery and uh, sometimes with chemotherapy with no evidence of disease recurrence. And so I think the, the, the take home point here is that um, we need to recognize uh, um, your risk for lung cancer, um, speak to your doctor, get a screening and, uh, you know, try to intervene as early as possible because outcomes are, um, can be very good. And also if uh, even in patients with more advanced disease, uh, there are really, really excellent success stories here. I am. Really wonderful to hear. And Dr. Lund, um, you know, you have a, a more technologically advanced manner to obtain lung tissue that might be malignant from a patient. Uh, do you want to tell us uh, about that and how it works? And, and as a patient, how do I see you? Absolutely. Um, first of all, I just wanted to, I mean, it's clear that all of us on this panel are very passionate about uh, lung cancer and care. And uh, I wanted to highlight what Dr. Palmer was saying. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary approach, so um, it requires everyone's uh, assistance and input and uh, help in managing one patient. Um, uh, so finding a lung nodule does not necessarily mean that it could be cancerous. So first of all, you know, patients have a lot of anxiety when a lung nodule is found with the next steps because they automatically assume it's cancerous. Uh, and this is where this multidisciplinary approach comes into play. Uh, we review the case together and we sort of decide, okay, if this is a high suspicion of cancer, uh, if there's no involvement that's obvious with the lymph nodes, they can go direct to surgery. Uh, but there are certain cases where it's not that obvious and tissue is needed. And that's where me and my colleagues come in. Uh, I particularly took a year uh, to train in interventional pulmonology, which allows us to biopsy very, very small lesions or nodules in the lung, even less than one centimeter um, with something called robotic bronchoscopy, which is essentially new generation of a new platform of biopsying lung nodules and it allows us to get very uh, distal or peripheral in the lung and biopsy things that we couldn't do before. And um, for some cases, you know, if there's obvious cancer involved and, but the patient has too many other illnesses and can't get surgery, that is very vital to get the diagnosis and get the tissue that uh, Dr. Chi will examine and Dr. Palmer will need to treat the patient uh, and offering that type of therapy that she mentioned, immunotherapy, uh, you know, targeted therapy, whatever it may be. Um, and it's also important if uh, we're not sure it's cancer and we use this technology to biopsy a nodule uh, before directly tipping somebody to surgery, this information is vital for Dr. O as well with thoracic surgery if we need to prove sometimes that that lesion is cancerous. Um, so all of us are very, you know, integral in working together and um, this technology will allow us to expedite patients' care alleviate their stress. And uh, now that we're offering that at permanent and cardiac medicine, uh, not having them travel out of network as well to get these biopsies done. That's really incredible what you do. I'm sure that it takes um, a, a very steady hand and uh, a lot of training to make it to the, the distal or peripheral parts of the lung and, and do so with accuracy. Um, we do have a question from Facebook, which is a great question. And the Dr. Lund, if you want to take it, it's what is the link to vaping uh, and lung cancer? 
Yeah, I was expecting that question. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, it's it's just like, you know, if you look at the ads from the 50s and 60s, there was doctors that were smoking cigarettes because uh, nobody really knew the side, uh, you know, the toxic effects of smoke in that time. Just like similarly, vaping is a relatively new thing. And uh, we don't have a clear correlation or enough data to say that it is as harmful or, you know, uh, can cause cancer just like cigarettes. But what, what I will say that we have seen cases of things such as called vaping induced lung injury, uh, where, you know, people can get very acute reactions, inflammation in the lungs that can get them very sick, uh, particularly, you know, if it's mixed with things that are not tobacco. Uh, so early on, we've seen signs and symptoms that even, you know, it's not safe. And also that depends with the frequency of use uh, and the type of use. Uh, so certainly I think as time goes on over the next 10, 15, 20 years, we'll get more data as to if it can cause cancer and things like that. But certainly what I say, it's safe for the lung? Absolutely not. We've seen cases where uh, we have patients that come in with damaged lungs and had to be treated with steroids. So uh, that's our take on that for now. And this might roll right into it. We, we're talking about damage to lungs. Uh, we have another Facebook question that's talking about chronic pneumonia. Is there an association with that and lung cancer? Um, well, I guess I can help answer that question too. So. Um, I think those two things are separate. So, you know, if you have certain large uh, masses or tumors in the lung that can push on the airways, that can cause something called post obstructive pneumonia as a result of the tumor. Uh, but a lot of the, uh, I wouldn't say anything's chronic pneumonia, but I would say a lot of the treatments, sometimes your immune system is uh, de decreased because of the treatments and you can get infections. Uh, but it really depends on the type of tumor and things you have. Um, but no, lung cancer won't necessarily give you chronic pneumonia. It depends uh, case by case basis. And I'll just add a little bit about what we see on CT um, examination. So with vaping, we definitely can see some inflammation in the lungs. Um, we often see other things. We're, we're looking for a lot of things on a screening chest CT, not just for nodules or abnormal lymph nodes, but we're looking at the lung itself for other smoking related changes. So as you may know, a lot if you have if you're a smoker, a long-term smoker, oftentimes you will develop emphysema. We see that pretty consistently. And if if someone is actively smoking, we can see some inflammation of the sort of the the more peripheral airways that also will show up. So we do look at the lungs very carefully, not just for nodules, but for all of the other smoking-related changes. Um, and just to add also. You know, when we image, it's not just the lungs we're seeing, we're imaging from the neck down to the upper abdomen in order to encompass the entire lungs. So it's not surprising that we sometimes see what we call incidental findings, things that we don't didn't really expect, but we need to, to describe and comment on. So um, for example, we see thyroid nodules quite frequently because we image the thyroid um, in the field of view for a chest CT. Um, we may comment on an aortic aneurysm, which is a dilation of the of the thoracic aorta, which is common, um, especially as you get older. Um, in the in the upper abdomen, we may see a liver finding that might need um, more evaluation. Breast masses, pancreatic masses. We do see quite a few incidental things, and I say this just so when when one gets their CT chest and gets results. And, and see some findings that are not necessarily related to the lungs, those will sometimes require a follow-up. Most of the time, they're absolutely nothing to worry about, but it is something that we see um, very frequently, other findings. And the, the, you know, everyone's mind is on COVID. Any association between COVID and lung cancer? There has been no direct uh, correlation with that. No, I know COVID's caused a myriad of uh, post-COVID symptoms and things like that, but no correlation. It's very good to know. Um, you know, what what is the timing that I can expect as a Kaiser Permanente patient? Will it take like a year or two years for me to get a diagnosis of lung cancer and then see my oncologist and, and get a treatment plan? No, not at all. You know, I think the primary care doctors are the forefront for screening. Uh, so they do an excellent job at screening and appropriately getting CAT scans for people that uh, meet the criteria. And once a suspicious lesion is found, uh, you know, we directly get a message and the uh, patient's either seen by, you know, a pulmonologist uh, right away, uh, which can arrange for a biopsy if needed. And then subsequently, once the biopsy is back, uh, if the patient needs staging to biopsy the lymph nodes, which the pulmonologist does as well, 
once the tissue is obtained and diagnosis and confirmed, um, you know, referral to surgery or, on, or an oncologist based on what the findings are, uh, all that happens within a month. Uh, so I would say from the time you find the abnormal lesion uh, to till you get treatment, you know, should be between 30 to 45 days. And I, I like to also add that uh, sometimes the the stage or, or the the size of the tumor or um, you know how how what we call um, advanced uh, de determines how quicker we move. And so sometimes we may need to um, um, triage or prioritize treatment of certain tumors or just more 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 um, uh, ex expanded tumors than some other ones. And, and in those scenarios, I, and I, I'm saying this from the surgical standpoint, there are scenarios where we would have to expedite scheduling patients to have some of their your tests or to have even surgery. And then, and, and, and that's to prevent further spread. But there, there's also a question about how long is it safe to wait? And I get this question a lot from my patients. And how long is it is it safe to wait? You know, or is this cancer going to spread? What am I going to do? Uh, but I, I want to say that there's some there's data that shows that even from diagnosis for early stage cancer, and again we're talking about cancer that's limited to the lung and has not spread yet, um, even up to 90 days um, is safe to to undergo treatment with surgery. Not to say that we we would sit and wait for it, but I think that um, as far as early stage cancer goes, it doesn't really spread that fast. But we always aim to. Uh, get our treatment mod modality started as soon as possible. And if we think it's, uh, it's, it's exponentially expanding there, we would expedite that process as well. I just wanted to, to second that. We just had a patient yesterday that was scheduled for a, a biopsy actually in, in August um, with radiology, but they didn't tolerate the procedure and uh, they were referred to us recently. And we just got the uh, biopsy done last week, came back positive, but it was an early stage cancer and there was still no lymph node involvement uh, and essentially the same, same cancer stage it was four months ago. So absolutely, Dr. O was right on that. So um, like as you will see, you know, like um, as the pathology received the biopsy sample um, from the colleagues and either out from our intervention radiologists or from our intervention pulmonologists, um, you usually, the pathology usually um, should be able to issue the pathology report um, diagnosing um, um, malignancy such as lung cancer or a benign finding um, within 24 hours or um, within two days. It's really incredible. Um, and I can understand the anxiety that goes with the, with the diagnosis of lung cancer. Um, Dr. Palmer, can you talk a little bit about uh, if patients are interested in clinical trials or if they're interested in, in nutritional or psychological um, support during their journey with you? Yes, absolutely. Um, we at uh, uh, Kaiser, we do have uh, access to some in-house clinical trials, but we, we're also able to uh, research what clinical trials may be available within the region and uh, refer patients for trials where where it's deemed uh, necessary or where the patient is fit for a particular trial. We, patients can be referred and uh, often do very well on trial, often coming back to us where we're necessary and where appropriate. And uh, so absolutely, we can get patients involved uh, in trials where it's, where it's necessary and appropriate. And um, um, we, we, we do approach each patient holistically. Um, the cancer treatment involves not just treating the cancer itself, but uh, we attend to the patient's nutritional needs. We have a team of nutritionists where patients can be referred where necessary. We have psychotherapists, we have social workers, as we try to address that patient's nutrition and psychosocial needs and uh, to really approach them as holistically as possible. We have all these resources within Kaiser, and um, sometimes we have to pivot with care depending on how a patient is doing. And uh, we take all this into account and we garner the help from colleagues from different departments where necessary. Well, this has been a really robust and informative conversation on lung cancer. 
Um, we've certainly highlighted our screening process uh, for patient care. And November is a lung cancer awareness month. So we're hopeful that this Facebook Live uh, event may encourage you to go see your primary care doctor and discuss any smoking or vaping history that you have. Um, so in closing, we'd like to think about what uh, the physician, physician panel uh, might see as the most important uh, step or um, next step in care for preventing lung cancer or uh, in the journey of someone who's diagnosed with lung cancer. I just wanted to say the single most important thing anybody can do at any age, any time is uh, consider smoking cessation. Stopping smoking is the number one thing we can do uh, to prevent cancer. Uh, so that's, you know, my last take on that. Uh, I'd like to also add to that and that even if even if uh, anyone's diagnosed with lung cancer and they're still smoking, um, it, you know, uh, it, it's still very important that and, and it's actually imperative that they quit smoking the moment they are diagnosed or they are they realize they're diagnosed because that also impacts the treatment and um, uh, surgical treatment or even treatment with chemotherapy can be uh, um, uh, can be lessened in, in, in the presence of continued smoking. Complication risks can still be increased when patients continue smoking. And even if they think that they've uh, acquired or, or now uh, now have lung cancer, it still prevents further occurrence of future lung cancer. And so there's never any late time to stop smoking. I think the moment as early as possible, including after being diagnosed, we always enforce or uh, encourage our patients to, to quit smoking. Yeah, and I'm going to pile on. Um, please stop smoking. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the best thing you can do. Um, but if you continue to smoke and if you're a high risk for developing lung cancer, talk to your doctor about whether you're eligible for lung cancer screening. And it's important that if you are eligible, that you get your annual screening so that we can try to detect the cancer um, as, as soon as possible and get treatment um, as early as possible. And again, it's not just lung cancer we're, look, we're looking at, we're looking at other smoking related uh, diseases or something incidental. So, so definitely follow up with your doctor and make sure you get your imaging. And I will echo those sentiments because it cannot be said enough that uh, stopping smoking is the single most important thing. And uh, also to understand if uh, uh, how high your risk is if uh, you have a smoking history and if you should be having screening, talk to your doctor as early detection offers the best chance of having surgical removal leading to cure. But even if uh, diagnosed with more advanced disease, remembering that we do have uh, treatments available that are more effective than um, even 10 years ago. In 2021, there were more than 10 new drugs approved for lung cancer alone. And uh, so we have treatment and uh, so please Please come into appointments with hope, knowing that uh, we, we can uh, talk you through this and we can offer different treatment modalities. And lastly, um, like Dr. Palmer just mentioned, um, like FDA continuously um, approve um, like new therapy, um, therapies um, like um, based on the tumor's molecular profile. Um, so here in Kaiser Permanent, um, Permanente Mid-Atlantic, uh, we do keep track of those new approval. If there's a new marker um, that is um, approved by FDA, um, our testing platform will certainly be updated. So you will always be treated with our most, most updated um, 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 therapy that's available. Thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining our Facebook Live event for Lung Cancer Awareness. We are definitely dedicated to your health and wellness and hope that this uh, program brought some important information to light for you. If you'd like more information, like the content of this uh, Facebook Live, please go to kp.org forward slash doctor. From all of us here at Kaiser Permanente, be well. Thank you. Thank you.